Okay, well, hello, Elena. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're so excited that you're um, able to take the time to interview with us and talk about your experiences, not just in Ming Kuang, but in um, or beyond Ming Kuang and even before that too. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, my name is Elena Lim Wong Viscovich. And I was in Ming Kuang home uh, from 1953 until it closed in 1958. Thank you. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about where and when you were born? Yes, I was born in Marysville, California. And um, I was orphaned, or I was told I was orphaned, and I lived with quite a few families in Chinatown in San Francisco. I see. And um, how, how did you find out about your parents? Or did you find out any information about them later on in life? It was really interesting. The, from what I could gather when the people gossiped in Chinese, I got all different stories. So I really don't know, didn't know much about my background until... Um, a cousin of mine saw me on television and then uh, in the newspaper and found out I was with the State Department of Education and called me and he was at the Pentagon. He was a captain. And I thought I was in trouble already because I had just expelled a young woman uh, from the public schools because she misused her, her status as being a student and trying to join and recruit in the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. And um, so I thought I had done something wrong. And he called me and says, I saw your picture. You look just like our family. Uh, and I'm your cousin. And so from there, I got to know more about that family. But it was really kind of shocking and not uncomfortable, but I wasn't sure how to take all of this until recently um, when I found, uh, uh, I, I went to a reunion with all these cousins and this huge family and I saw people that looked like me and we had freckles and I go, oh boy, they must be related to me. But more than that, um, I was tracing uh, their backgrounds and found a habeas corpus document. And it showed that my grandfather was born here in 1880 in San Francisco. So I've been delving into the family history and it's, it's really quite interesting because now history is a reality and I can see the tie-ins of how things happened. Wow, that's very interesting. Were you able to find other family records uh, by researching the genealogy? Yes, um, first of all, um, when I went to the home, there wasn't much information, Ming Kuang home, there wasn't much information on me. And so when I finally went to work, uh, the phone company had to do a security uh, vetting of me because it was a security building. And they gave me my birth certificate. And that was my first uh, information on, on myself. And then about six months ago, I went up to Marysville and found my mother's death certificate. So pieces are beginning to fall into place. Wow, that's quite amazing. Um, uh, so I guess um, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, what your childhood was like in San Francisco Chinatown and kind of going between um, different houses and different families that you were living with at the time? Well, it was very difficult because in the Chinese culture, there's a name for every relative in the family. And then when you're, you're not a real relative or you're not in, in, in birth order of something, you call people that are your friends and neighbors, auntie and uncles. And I, I never knew who was real and who wasn't. And so it was difficult for me uh, living in San Francisco. And I was a very precocious child. Uh, 
when I didn't like it, when I, I, I went to about seven schools by the time I was in the second grade. And if I didn't like the teacher, I would pretend I didn't speak English. But meanwhile, I'm listening and I memorized all the pre-primers and the primers so I could recite any page they wanted. And they just didn't know what to do with me. And any time I didn't like something, I'd run away. And you could find me at the, um, the Young Museum. You could find me at I Magnon's department store or sneaking backwards into a movie house to see a, a matinee. So, <clears throat> and I, I knew every bus driver and streetcar driver in San Francisco. So I really got preferential treatment from them because they kind of watched out for me and their wives always had an extra sandwich for me. So I had something to eat. And then, you know, uh, I, I just survived that way for many years. Oh, I see. Um, and so I, I'm guessing that school was just uh, lots of ups and downs, probably, and um, you it probably... Was, yeah, mm -hmm. it was really difficult because, you know, like they would say, oh, it's Mother's Day, you need to make a card for your mother. And mm -hmm. I'm going, I don't have a mother. And they said, well, do the best you can. So I just found that was kind of insecure or that they just didn't know any better, you know? And so sometimes if I really respected a teacher, I'd go to school and to her class. If I didn't respect them, I'd take off. You know, I would show up for the beginning of the class perhaps, and then by lunchtime, I'm gone. <laughs> so I, I did some, you know, things that were hard for them to control, shall we say. But I did also learn a lot because one of the things I remember in the um, fourth grade is um, she was talking about an American can be president. And so, you know, me, I said, well, then I can be president of the United States. And she says, no, you have to be an American. And I says, I'm an American. I'm also Chinese, but I'm an American. She says, no, no, no. I mean, you need to be white. And I go, oh, well, that's not what it says. And if we got into argument and I walked out. I was sent to the principal and I didn't want to see the principal. So I just left for the day. That's a good call, I think. <laughs> Especially because you were right. Um, you were, you are an American. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, I guess. How did um, whoever was your guardian at the time, how did they hear about Ming Huang and those services and, and how did you end up there? You know, um, I was in so much trouble, you know, I, that uh, I would take library books and didn't return them, things like that. And so I had some contact with Cameron House in San Francisco. Uh, but I never had the 25 cents for the offering or for the extra activities. So I went sporadically and I really don't know how um, I was placed, uh, who placed me in Ming Kuang. All I remember is uh, in January 1953, it was a cold, cold, clear day and I was taken uh, by car, by a person they called my father, who I never saw, so I didn't know who he was, but I just sat there and I figured, well, going somewhere is better than staying where I was. So um, they drove me down to Ming Kwong home. It was just before lunch. And you have to picture me. I was truly the ugly duckling. I was 50 pounds. My skin was very yellowish. I had a double row of teeth because they never pulled my baby teeth. So teeth were coming either in the front of it or in the back of it. And uh, when I got there, it was close to 12. So this person turned me over to Miss Hayes, the director, and she said, would you like lunch? And I said, oh, yes, lunch, <laughs> you know? And she says, well, you know, all your your uh, um, 
classmates or your roommates are going to be in school. So you're going to have to eat with the little kids. So I sat at Miss A's table and uh, the menu was grilled cheese sandwich with salad, milk, and uh, ice cream. Well, I gobbled everything up and she said, would you like seconds? And I said, oh yes, please, but not the salad. So by the time they got through with me, I ate three grilled cheese sandwiches, drank two eight ounce glasses of milk, and had five double scoops of ice cream. I thought I was in heaven. And then I was, you know, I was looking at the little kids and said, what am I gonna do till some kids my age show up? And so I said, could I please watch the presidential inauguration? And Miss Hayes looked at me and I think she figured out I was going to be trouble. So she says, oh, of course. And so I spent my time enjoying my day till my, my uh, roommates came. <laughs> and that's how I got into Ming Kwong home. That's a great story. And also a great welcoming meal. I mean, a grilled cheese sandwich and ice oh. cream. That sounds like literally like heaven. <laughs> it, it really was. I mean, just to have regular meals was so exciting for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that must have been such a contrast. Um, to Because it seems like you were pretty underweight when you came yeah, Kong, and so. you know, it, what what struck me about Ming Kwong is we were living in cottages and there, uh, I think there were about 15 girls about my age and I was in the older girls group. And I had, because all the other girls had been assigned a roommate, I was given a room by myself, but it was a real bed with sheets and blankets and they had a, um, kind of a recreation room and it had a huge library. There wasn't a TV there, but they had a, a um, what is it, a record player and they had books. And I looked and I said, oh boy, the Nancy Drew series. And I had a book to read every night, you know, it was just so exciting for me. I, mm -hmm. I, I was in seventh heaven. <laughs> That's great. And uh, I know that the last time we talked, you talked about um, sports and kind of uh, uh, learning how to play. Well, I think you learned how to play tennis in San Francisco, right? And then you yes. probably continued some sports in Los Gatos. Well, you know, what was interesting is um, Los Gatos in terms of a school system was, was just so unique because they had such high standards. And so I really had to scramble because when they looked at my transcripts, they promoted me a year ahead of my class that where I was in San Francisco. So I went into the sixth grade and this Mr. Penelman, uh, I kept on getting uh, B pluses and I said, gee, what's wrong with my papers? They're beautiful. I mean, it was gorgeous handwriting and I had pictures and illustrations and margins were straight. And he said, well, you know, I need you to think. I need you to ask yourself questions. Why did somebody do this? What was it from his point of view? And then how do you feel about it? And you need to write this into your answers. And, um, I'm like, oh gosh, I better scramble. And one of the things is math. I was always good in, in computations. When I was in uh, school in San Francisco, I was in um, a low fifth, high fifth grade class. And so I would sit near the high fifth so that when I learned all my low fifth grade math assignment, I'd listen to what the high fifth grade and I do it too. And I would be very quick and I felt, you know, pretty competent in my skills. But when I got to Mr. Penniman's class, I didn't want to be plus. I needed to A. I needed to be on top of the class. And I couldn't get mad at him because there was no way to run away. Uh, you know, it was a long ways from downtown when you're a little kid. You're in the hills of Los Gatos and downtown only had that one theater and we were Chinese. They would have seen me and known 
that I was running away. So that wasn't any good. So I decided I better buckle down and settle down. And although I only stayed in the Los Gatos Elementary School for eight, uh, well, I was in Los Gatos for eight months, but I finished the sixth grade there. I really wanted to go to seventh grade in Los Gatos because being that I was a little precocious, one of the, the things that I remember most about getting into trouble with is breakfast. They, by the grade level, they assigned how much you had, you would get to eat and you would get a dish of fruit and then you would get two pieces of, half pieces of toast and you would get mush. And that oatmeal mush was so hard it consolidated and so I, I could eat the toast and the fruit but, and drink my hot chocolate or the milk, but that's all I wanted. And if you didn't finish it, you get it for lunch. And if you weren't there for lunch, you get it for dinner till you finished it. And I'm going, oh. So I got, I, I was very smart. I found out where the bathroom was. And so I, I would nudge the girl and they would distract the house mother sitting at my table. So I take the bowl of mush and throw it into my cotton napkin, wrap it up and then be excused to go to the bathroom and throw it into the bath uh, toilet. Well, the toilet jammed and <laughs> I was assigned KP duty again. And that was fine with me, except that in the mornings you would be late for school. And all the girls left before me because they were going to be on time. So I would tear out of that kitchen and I was running and I really got a joy out of running. And one time the coach for the seventh and eighth grade kids was standing at the gate and there was word that I was coming. I guess somebody told them, take a look at this, this kid because she can run. And he clocked me and he says, uh, I'd like you on the running team next year. And so I was really just totally deflated when, when the director of Ming Kwong said, well, we are moving the seventh grade girls into o the Oakland Ming Kwong because you need to learn about the Chinese culture and get to know the Chinese community. And I truly did not want to leave. I, I just thought the world of the school system there and that I, I could get some athletic training. And as I said before, I had learned how to play tennis um, on the streets and in the playgrounds of Chinatown and I was rather quite good. So I was hoping to perfect that. Well, it, it, it was a dream that was kind of um, put by the wayside until uh, the, the 10th grade and when I entered um, high school. And that's when they really uh, found out how good I was because I, had to play with the boys <laughs> and I won. <laughs> Not only can you, are you eligible to be the president, you're also <laughs> eligible to play against the boys and win. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, so then you were, you attended sixth grade um, at what, what was the name of the school? Was it the Las Gatos Grammar School or was it, it was University a, Avenue? It was, I don't remember the name of it. I just remember we had to run all the back streets and down a hill and it's like crossing a bridge. Oh, yeah. So, so that, it, that must have been the University Avenue um, School, which is now Old Town. Yes, yes, because I was driven there and it looks so different because it looked huge when I was little, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, over and over again, I was just so lucky to have Mr. Pennerman as my teacher. And I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but when I was a consultant at the State Department of Education, I was standing in the lobby one day and I saw this man coming with a delegation of people and he was going into the State Board of Education meeting. And I said, excuse me, are you Mr. Pennerman? And he had won the Teacher of the Year Award. So oh, obviously wow. he was just such an excellent teacher. And mm -hmm. I am so grateful to this day that he did 
what he did for me because I think in many ways he motivated me to be a real good teacher. Mm, wow, that's a that's a wonderful story, and I'm, it's so great that you got to to meet him later on, so many yeah, years later. To yeah. tell him, you know, because I don't yeah. think teachers really know how they affect a life of someone, mm -hmm. and um, it, it taught me a lesson later uh, uh, when I was an assistant superintendent in a small school district in LA, uh, in Monterey Park. And I was uh, re reading a book to uh, a, a class of, I think they were about third graders. And the principal nudged me, he says, that kid sitting there is always mouthing off and she's having problems uh, at home and on and on. And I remember telling her, um, you know, when I was little, I was an orphan and um, I didn't know who my parents were and I blamed people for not having enough food to eat or an unsafe place to live. And then one day I woke up and said, you can blame people all the time and you can spend your life blaming people but what are you going to do about it? So you better take care of yourself because nobody else will. And I said that as a comment to her and apparently she told the principal, I'm changing my life around. I am going to be like Dr. Wong. And I go, oh, but somebody listened to me for once. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's very rewarding. Um, so let's see then. Um, you left Ming Kuang kind of abruptly then to go back to, to go back up north in Oakland. Yeah. Um, what was it like? Because uh, it that was a Ming Kuang home too up there in Oakland, and so you attended. How long were you there? Well, I um, was there from 1954 to 1958 when the home closed. So I was able to finish. 11th grade in Ming Kuang home. Okay. And uh, I understand why they tried to move uh, to, to give us a, a broader life because, you know, when we were in Las Gatas, because we were 12 to 15 girls our age and then another 40 kids that were younger than us, we had our own playmates and um, we were also pretty obvious that we were a minority. We were Chinese. And so, you know, we were identified as a group. And to this day, I don't remember being invited to anybody else's house to play. Where when we moved to Oakland, we, were, we went to a school that was predominantly Chinese. And I have to say seventh and eighth grade there were a total waste of time for me. But I stayed because by that time I learned no more running away. And it wasn't until I, I got into the ninth grade that I began being um, stimulated by, by what I could do. And, um, you know, since I had excelled, I was always placed in the college prep or the advanced placement classes. And so... One of the things Ming Kuang did for us is it had a lot of visitors and some of these people um, were our sponsors of Ming Kuang. And one of the sponsors, Mr. and Mrs. Hall, um, took a liking to me. He was the vice president of Matson Liners. And um, I got a sense of what home life really was. And they had grown children. So they always encouraged me to go to college and they were always talking about their experiences. And one went to Stanford, another went to Cal. And I figured, well, since I don't have any money, I don't think I could go to Stanford. But uh, because our high school, although it was a technical high school, it had a very strong academic program for college. Um, and I had a wonderful PE teacher. She encouraged me and um, I was probably one of the few 
young women at that time that got my block T athletic um, um, sweater by the time I was uh, in my junior year. So she saw my potential and she, you know, encouraged uh, uh, me not only to, to competitively play, but there were people that would also coach me that were from a country club or whatever. And so I was really given the best that Ming Kwong could give me. And, uh, you know, I, I've been very fortunate in that sense. But when the home closed, it was devastating because uh, I was given two choices. You could um, go uh, back to a relative or you could take a job as a care, uh, caregiver for a nanny for some family. And I was never quite uh, domesticated enough to do chores and cook and things like that. And I saw the director's face, Miss Musgrave, and it, she was in such pain in trying to place us because she was just devastated the home had to close. So I lied. I told her, oh, I'm going to my relatives. And so I moved out and one of the other girls that graduated from Ming Kwong had an apartment and she was working. So I moved in with her for almost a year and I worked at the uh, Peralta Hospital as a, a kitchen aide so I could deliver meals to the, uh, to the patients. And that's how I got through my last year of senior high school. Wow. And so she, did she live in Oakland? Yes, that that's, Oakland. that's why I was able to finish uh, going school to there. school there. But at the end of my senior year, I had um, a friend who introduced me to her family. And it turns out that her aunt and uncle adopted me after I graduated from high school. So oh, my wow. dad is a, was a six foot three Irish American and my mom was a five feet round Italian American. And they, they did well by themselves. Um, my dad was in real estate and my mom owned an Italian restaurant with her sister and her mother. And so um, even though I, uh, I wasn't going to be supported to go to college because they thought women should go to work or get married. And um, I wanted to go to school because I knew I had the Cal scholarship and that paid enough for tuition and a meal ticket. And I could ride the bus to go to school every day. And so um, they supported me in that. And then they were so surprised because they came to a tennis match at the Cal Stadium there. And they go, are all these good people going to be watching you play? I go, yeah, but it won't be long because I figured out how I'm going to win this game already. So I hope she's not too good. <laughs> and I was lazy. I didn't want to run. So I placed all my shots and <laughs> won fast and got out. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's funny. Wow. So uh, what were your parents' names? Um, my uh, parents are Ann and Bob Hayden. And that's a nice name, but... Uh, I really didn't use it because uh, using the last name would be saying I was not Chinese, perhaps white when people were reading my resume. And I learned a very important lesson. I was, uh, when I went to work and graduated from college, I was at the beginning of the civil rights movement. And I remember uh, I, I turned in my, my application to a very prestigious department store and I put Elena Hayden on there. When they saw me, they said the job was filled already. And 
it wasn't even an interview. So I knew something was wrong. And when I went back to class, my girlfriend, who was blonde, petite, gorgeous, uh, applied for the same job. And so she says, well, I turned the job down after you because I didn't like the way they treated me. So it shows you that, you know, you can't judge people by the color of their skin. There's, a, there's something wonderful when somebody has that integrity that she could say, I can turn that down because it was the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you always take those as lessons because uh, the orphanage taught us that, to stand up for those who couldn't do for themselves and to always tell the truth. Now, sometimes if you don't ask me, I'm not going to tell you, but <laughs> I will tell you the truth if you ask me. And to try to do it so that you don't hurt people's feelings. Right. Yeah, that's a great lesson. Um, and, you know, I just thought of how Ming Kuang just exemplified that, right? Because um, they were taking in Chinese girls because nobody else would, right? Um, so these other agencies or, um, you know, childcare type of things or orphanages were really limited in terms of who they would accept. So, uh, you know, yeah. to the time period, I mean, when you look at history, the fact mm -hmm. that when Ming Kuang was started in 1925 in the Oakland Hills, um, yeah. It was the only institution in the United States that would take Chinese girls or Chinese American girls or Chinese and, and mixed marriage girls. And they were coming from the East Coast, from Panama. They were coming from all over. I don't know how they got there, but when you got, uh, there was no acceptance of them anywhere else. And then it wasn't until you know, the 1950s, be, be, before that turned around, before the courts were getting some of us because we were um, in the juvenile courts for many reasons. But um, it, it's, it's striking that over time, things change and referrals change. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I know one of the reasons you wanted to do this interview is to sort of correct some uh, misconceptions uh, regarding Ming Kuang and um, the, the girls um, and their backgrounds. Do you yes. want to talk a little bit about that? I do. Let me preface that by saying that my career um, has taken over so much of my life. And so I have lived in... Oakland, San Francisco, Sacramento, Monterey Park, San Gabriel Valley, and then up to Sacramento, and then uh, to Stockton as my last employment. And so I hadn't seen these girls since 1958, and but I kept in touch with one or two of them. And so one of them told, uh, uh, Uplift Family Services that bought Ming Kuang home, that there was going to be a, a celebration of Ming Kuang, and there was going to be a luncheon, and then there would be a reunion at the um, Las Gatas, noon Las Gatas Museum, and then we would be able to have a reception over at the Ming Kuang home on Loma Alta Avenue. And I said, oh, wow, I haven't seen some of these girls for 40 years. This is going to be fun. So I went and um, I, I was uh, so happy to see my friends, my sisters, because I wanted to know what happened to them. And by the time we got to the Los Gatos Museum, I was flabbergasted because... Uh, it said they're um, uh, orphans of prostitutes. Uh, Ming Kuang, a rescue home for prostitutes, were some of the headings on the things. And I kept on looking at myself and he said, that 
can't be because that's not us. And so I decided, well, what can we do about it? And so two of the girls wrote the San Jose Mercury and tried to correct it. And it didn't go very well because they said, well, if you want to correct something, you can write a 150 word rebuttal and uh, we may print it. I said, no, we're not going to do that. So I, I decided to do some research and I am an academic kind of person, you know, I document everything and I've learned how to do it through the dissertation. So I found out that it all started because of the work of a very powerful feminist missionary, Donna Dina Cameron. She went to um, the Presbyterian Mission Home in 1895, and there were rescues going on for victims of human trafficking that were Chinese from 1877. So she came in and she was really moving that. And sometimes at the um, uh, unhappiness of the people that that were the sponsors of the Presbyterian Church, which were men that were the deacons. But it was the wives that said, no, Donna Dina, you need to keep on doing this. So she was known for this and, and uh, that went on for quite a time. However, by 1915, the mission home in San Francisco that took in these victims of human trafficking were also picking up children that were uh, neglected off the streets of San Francisco, boys and girls. So Donna Dina Cameron um, and the Tooker sisters decided they would establish a Tooker Memorial Home for Chinese boys and girls. And it was accepting children all over the place. Ms. Cameron felt that it was wrong to keep the victims of human trafficking and the young children together because um, they were learning um, about the victim's lifestyle. The, their, their language was uh, left a lot to be desired. And the kids were picking up a lot of swear words and bad words. And, and so she moved them to Oakland in 1915 to took her home. Well, by 1925, that had become overflowing where she was renting some flats nearby to house the extra children. And um, she was really quite a fundraiser. She met uh, Captain Robert Dollar, and she told him about the problem of not having enough room and um, how she was going to work with um, the Baptist Church to open Chong Mei Home for the boys, but she still needed room for the girls. So Mr. Uh, Captain Dollar donated enough money to build Ming Kwong Home in 1925 on the Mills College campus. And it was there that um, the, the problems of the community were still coming with kids that had tuberculosis, asthma, and such. And so Donna Dean Cameron said, well, we need to expand Ming Kwong to Las Gatas, so they opened Ming Kwong Las Gatas in 1934, first for tuberculosis and for uh, asthma and, and the respiratory problems. And then she said, uh, and the Chinese community by then had grown, there were marriages, there were children. Uh, and so she said, um, we need to move the Ming Kwong home that's on the Mills College campus to near to Chinatown in Oakland. So that was established in 1935. So you can see there was a huge span of time and yet because of the sensationalism 
of Donna Dean and Cameron, people link everything all together and don't draw the distinctions of the locations and the functions of Ming Huang home versus the missionary home that was a rescue for prostitutes. And, you know, I'm not going to judge why they did it, but they did. And it's, if you look on Google, you will set, you will see uh, headlines, rescue home for prostitutes, Presbyterian and prostitutes, orphanage for young sex slaves, orphans of prostitutes. And I thought, oh my gosh, we've got to get this corrected. Because for many of us, we had little to nothing. And we were able to make a better life, life for ourselves and our families. And for many of us, we have done well in our professions. We have doctors, we have nurses, we have uh, heads uh, of, of uh, uh, corporations. We've got women who, who volunteer, you know, in their communities, they work on the, uh, the, in the shelters, they give food and serve food for the Salvation Army. So they have picked the best of the values that Ming Kuang Home has taught us and lived it. And we're now 65 to 94 years old. Some of us have passed away. I think it's time that we live with some dignity and with some respect for what we did and that we were not prostitutes children and we were not sex slaves, but we were kids that had a difficult time. And, you know, some of us were orphans, some of them were not. Some of them were pro uh, products of a mixed marriage. Some were from divorces. Um, they're, they're just a whole slew of reasons. And this has been documented in the Ming Pong logs, as well as in the book that Nona uh, Mock Wyman wrote and the interviews that I've done with a number of the Ming Kuang sisters. And we just want people to know that we're very grateful for Ming Kuang and for the kindness those missionaries uh, gave us because, you know, to be a spinster and a missionary, you, you kind of wonder, you know, what they could instill on us, but they gave us met many gentle ways, but also some backbone because I, you know, work very hard in standing up for what's correct. And I've had to make real tough decisions as a acting superintendent and an and a, and a associate superintendent. I took care of the Cleveland shooting crises. And when 29 kids are shot and people are screaming at you and people want to run studies on the kids that don't make any sense, and, and board members are saying, just take care of it, and newspapers are on your back, there's a time where you have to say, no, we can't do this. And you have to be careful what you say that it's not used against you or the district, but that you're working for the benefit of kids. And my teaching experience has been the same way. I've moved very quickly through the teaching ranks because I was very non-traditional. And, uh, you know, I always found another way to get to the problem when it seemed like there was no other way. And it's been my privilege to work for people like uh, Wilson Riles, because I was brought in to help put meat to the bones of some legislation by writing the regulations and then training my, my peers to monitor that. And he challenged me and he says, you know, we've got this little fund that's really good. It's only four and a half million, but it's for innovation and it's for grants the schools can apply for. And I said, well, send me back to Washington. I can talk to the people, just point them out to me. So I did my homework, went back to Washington and I got $14.5 million. And we had a program that was recognized to the United States because I took the best of the research, of the literature, I had evaluation designs, and I had panels to read the, the 
uh, proposals. So when Willie Brown gets mad at me and says, well, why didn't my proposals from a school district in my district didn't get funded? I said, let me tell you why. And I could bring out the, the scores and by criteria, I could say they didn't do their homework. They didn't prove that this proposal was worth funding. And it got around that, you know, she knows what she's talking about and she has a system that makes it work. So I have learned that people give you the benefit of the doubt if you have a good reason for what you do. And so I've been lucky to have that advantage. And I, I, I'm just really pleased that you're doing this project because Ming Huang has influenced so many lives the volunteers there, even the kids that gave us a party at Stanford showed us that you need to get, prepare yourself in order to go to college. You need to know where you're going and how to get there and what sources are available for you. And so, you know, we've benefited from the best and it just shows you that kindness, caring, um, wanting to do better for yourself or have others wanting to care for you. You need to know where to trust that. And that in spite of all the conflicts, there's still a way you can get to your destination. Very, very well said. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, yeah, I mean, by now, Daniel and I have met maybe about six of the Ming Huang ladies and, uh, we're just always blown away every time we talk to uh, any of you because not only of your accomplishments and and how you went from having you know nothing to you know just going off to college and and graduating and um, having families of your own um, you know being very uh, established in your careers all of that stuff and also. Uh, just your personalities are so awesome, and um, we are and different, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're all very easy to talk to, um, very gracious, very kind, and so it's been such a wonderful um, uh, journey just talking and getting to know all of you. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that and sharing the history about Ming Kwong and Donald Dina, Dina Cameron as well. Um, that is definitely, I mean even after all this time, I still feel like there's lack of, of resources out there that um, have, you know, that solid research and which is kind of astounding to me, but, you know, well, hopefully, you know, it, <laughs> yeah. it's going to change because I think mm -hmm. once I finished the PowerPoint last week and it's got to be edited and cleaned up, but, um, and I have a list of the literature and the reference sources by page. And, um, you know, from 1877 to 2024, it's going to be 16 decades. And I think it's time we correct the misinformation. You know, it, it's yeah. just only right. And, I think because most of the girls have have either uh, just ignored what happened to them in order to survive, or they have found it's just too much work fighting it. Because when you come up with a big newspaper and they say that, what are you going to do? You know, write that 150 word <laughs> rebuttal, which you get on the back of the first page that is condensed to one paragraph, that, that's not going to do it. And um, I'm hoping that we will be able to work with people rather than come after them with a hammer. Uh, I want you to know what was really exciting is one of the Ming Pong girls that I found who's 94 years old, um, she has dementia, so it's difficult to interview her, but she wrote a biographical sketch because she volunteered to raise money for the community center at Technical High School where she graduated in Oakland. And it told all about her and I couldn't find her. I went on Google. So finally I found the lady that wrote 
the biographical sketch. And she gave me uh, the phone number of this woman's son. He's a former district attorney in San Joaquin County. So, you know, we have resources that could go the legal end, but we choose not to, because I think going with, with being nice about it rather than going with a big hammer gets a lot more done. And, you know, I'm still alive. And so I figure I have about five more years before I get kind of senile, though I do forget things <laughs> that we can get there. No, you're still very much alive and, and well and um, very well spoken. Yeah. So um, did you want to share a little bit about, uh, I guess, what happened beyond college? And I know you've already shared some great stories about working with Wilson Riles and and being um, superintendent in uh, multiple cities. So you went from Monterey Park to Stockton, I think. And I, I just feel like you've done so much, I can't even like, like <laughs> rehearse it right now. Or, yeah. <laughs> um, no, you know, uh, I think one of the things that uh, I've always had the ability to do is to plan alternatives. And the uh, after I graduated from college, my major was in business administration and marketing. So uh, I went to work for the phone company and they gave me more than four years of business education. I mean, I learned hierarchies and system management and, and, and all the details and public relations. They even sent me to modeling school, you know, and we had to learn how to speak well in public. And so, uh, and we, we were really great in behavioral objectives. So that was a building block. And then when I moved to Oakland um, and I had a baby, I just couldn't stay at home. I, I just felt I needed to work. So I took the test for the, um, deputy county clerk for Alameda County, because my cousin was uh, from, from my Italian side, was working in the personnel office. And she said, they have an opening, you gotta apply. And I said, all right. And I'm like, gee, I didn't study. I'm gonna really be in trouble, but you know, I said, well, whatever. So I took the test and she calls up an hour later and she said, you nearly had a perfect test. They've never had anything like that. I says, well, good, but how much is it gonna pay and where can I have a job? And she says, there's an opening at the Board of Supervisors and um, they'll teach you everything, don't worry. And so I went there and I learned all about regulations and procedures and filing of grievances. And then I got a job in the DA's office that turned into the county council's office, which taught me about school law. And, and you know, I, I got to meet all the people that were having to be defended by the county council's office, including Oakland Public Schools. And they told me, Elena, what are you doing here managing an office? You should be teaching. I said, oh, how much does it pay, you know? And they said, oh, it pays very good as a daily rate and we can get you in as a provisional. I says, you know what? I've been watching how my daughter is learning and I understand those processes. Yeah, I think I can do it. And I substituted for a week in the junior highs teaching physical education. And then my second job was substituting at an elementary school. And after two days in a first grade classroom, they said, would you like to take over the class because the, the teacher is not coming back. She's going to take pregnancy leave. So I taught for five years without the right credentials. I was learning every night before the class what I was supposed to teach. I was going to every in-service possible. I was taking one or two courses at Holy Names because they had a reputation for um, reading specialist credentials. So I did that. And uh, finally, they said, you can't uh, uh, teach for us anymore because you don't have the correct 
credential, you're going to have to go back to school. By that time, I have taught five years and said, now what am I going to do? So I was called up by one of the coordinators in Oakland and said, there's a teacher core program. And uh, it's two years and it's a minority program, but uh, they'll pay you uh, to work 20 hours in the school and go to classes during the daytime. I said, fine. I said, are you telling me how many units I have to take or can I take as many as I want? And does this cover summer school? And they said, oh, you can do anything you want if you can get in. Well, I went to a group interview and I was told that I wasn't a minority because I was the only Asian in, in, in the whole group. There were 30 some odd of us. And I said, where does it say that Asians are not a minority? And they said, no, it's just for us. And, and I looked at the administrator who was doing the interview and he was going, yes, yes, yes. Uh, me agreeing with the group of, of other interviewees. And I says, well, I don't think so. I'm going down to the county council's office and I will take legal action against you if you don't open up the space for me. So I went down there and they helped me write a deposition and a letter and such. But apparently my words had gone up the ladder in the administration. And it just happened that one of my neighbors said, oh no, Elena, she will really uh, embarrass you. <laughs> let her in. I went in there and I looked at their curriculum and the other kids were just, some of them weren't serious. And so I said to them, you know what? You make all the noise and you appoint me as your leader and I will negotiate for you. So we got free parking in the staff parking at San Francisco State. <laughs> You know, we got free free lunch tickets so that we didn't have to pay for our lunches. And I says, it works, guys. But they didn't follow through. And I did because I had a child and I needed to finish so I could go to work. And I finished in a year and a half. The, the cutest story is Senator, uh, uh, is a... Uh, 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 Hayakawa when he was president of San Francisco State. I was told I could not take more than 20 units. And I didn't, didn't say, I don't believe you. I said, well, who has the, the ability to make the decision above you? And the dean said, the president of the college. And I said, oh, okay. So I just went over there and he had to go to the bathroom. And I wouldn't let him go into the bathroom till he okayed my units because I had straight A's. I was on in the honor group and all that, you know, all those societies and all that. And so he says, okay, I'll allow you to take 21 units, but you have to bring back your grades uh, to show me how well you did. Well, of course I got all A's because I was no longer dating. I had, my social life was my daughter and my family. So I just buckled up and then I figured out if I went to summer school and went six units that were at San Francisco State and I was short six units at the community college for some basic class I, I didn't take. So I went back and I got that and I took 24 units and I still got all A's and I finished in a year and a half. And I was finished in January, where I knew there wouldn't be so much compet competition in, in getting a job. And they said to me, Elena, um, we have a problem. Our teachers don't know, and our principals don't know how to write behavioral objectives. And uh, we also need uh, training on the ethnic minorities and how they make up our, our community. And, and I said, well, I just happen to have a program. I've been volunteering at the um, Educational Programming of Cultural Heritage in Berkeley Unified. And I've been teaching the course on multi-ethnic education as well as the history of the Chinese American. And I know I can help 
people write, the Japanese American, the Afro American, and the Hispanic American programs. And so we could have that done for you all in about four months, and then we can start our in service. And this is the budget I need. Well, they said, go at it. The superintendent was new, and he says, I can't believe this. And it was that that just kind of skyrocketed my career straight up. And when I was told by Oakland that you had to be a principal uh, for five years and a vice principal five years before they would move you into administration, I said, I'm not staying around that long because I've run around the block a couple of times. I'm going outside. So I got a job in Berryessa School District in San Jose as the coordinator of human relations and the director of staff development. And then Wilson Rouse says, why don't you come work for me in Sacramento? And I did that, you know, and then when Wilson left and Bill Honick came, uh, the funding for my innovation uh, project dried up and I, I was relegated to nutritional services, counting how many turkeys we could convert into cubes to send out to the schools and I'm going, Oh my God, this is a waste of time. My, my doctorate, all the work I did. So I went to Bill and to the deputy and I said, this is my paycheck. I haven't cashed it yet. I'm not gonna cash it. You need to find something else for me to do because I'm not earning this paycheck and I, I refuse not to earn my paycheck. And they said, well, why don't you come and work for us in the administration office in external affairs and I want you to be the executive secretary of the Council of Asian and Pacific Affairs. I says, what do I do? They said, it's a job you're going to create and you're going to create this council. I said, oh, fun. And I used my ingenuity and we were so organized. We had hearings across the state. And then I met people in the Screen Actors Guild and I says, you need to testify and why we need more role models. And if you can't say it right, I'll write it for you. And you act it out. But <laughs> what we did, we built a storm up that we were challenged by all the other ethnic groups and they used us as the model. And we had a voice finally, you know, and, and things change because you've got to find a different way to get to the, to the issues and society problems without really tearing everything apart. You can do it. And, and that's, that's the story I wanted to share with you is there are a lot of people like me out there. So don't ever ask me where I live. No, the question is, where did you come from? And they're, they're asking me if I came from China or, you know, some foreign country. And I said, oh no, I'm from California. And then they go, Oh, no, no. Where did you come from? I said, well, let's see. I've lived and I named the cities. And then finally they said, no, what are you? You know, and I finally say, oh, I'm an American of Chinese descent. I'm third generation. Where did you come from? You know, and we can turn it around, but we turn it around in a way where we're teaching a lesson and they don't really get mad by the time I'm through with them. You know, they want to help. And so I think we don't need to approach things like that and make things better. <laughs> anyway, I, that was a long story, but I, I just had to tell you about that. Yeah. Where did you come from? Because so many of us have faced that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Well, um, I think that whatever you, you did, it worked and um, you were able to convince many people of your ability. So um, it's very clear through your accomplishment. And now um, I have to depend on you and Dan. Dan, <laughs> you got to cut everything out that's a hum, because I used to be fine 50 cents every time I said anum and a hum. And that's how I learned to, to, to speak I in didn't sentences. Hear, I didn't hear you say any of those. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we're okay. <laughs> um, Daniel, did you have any like last questions before we look at a few photos? I know I probably missed a few things. Um, no, I, I think it's just really inspiring to, to listen to your life trajectory um, because you've, you've done so much in so many different ways and different communities. Um, so I feel like 
pretty privileged to be able to talk to you. Um, and I do, I did uh, go through and I, I think you've covered all the things that I had questions about. Oh, great. Daniel, are you, is that scenery behind you? Because the tree is not even moving. It's fake, yeah. Oh, um, oh it's a, a, a screenshot behind we, you? We share a workspace, so I was trying to be um, <laughs> incognito, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, working from home, right? That's uh, that's how it goes. Um, <laughs> was the light okay? I mean, yeah, it's yeah, good. yeah. A, a, and the sound is perfect. Everything is good. Yeah. Oh, great. All right. Well, I'm going to share my screen now and go through some of uh, those four photos. Okay. Um. So one second here. Let me get that set up. I'm surprised that they came through. Okay. I think. Your video is still pinned, so that's good. Okay. okay. Well, do, do you see it? Yes. That, that first okay. one. Do you see my arrow right here? Um, that's me. Your arrow. Uh, okay. Uh, see where the it says Corinne Louis goes straight up, and the the person at the back with a plaid shirt. Right here. Yep, that's me. Oh. Uh, at Los Gatos. Wow. In the sixth grade. Very cool. And it looks like you have the other names here. Like yeah. Corinne, um, Dolly. This is Corinne, Dolly. Laverne has passed away. Joanne. Uh, Sandra Chung. Now, it's interesting. Sandra is half Hawaiian. And she was really beautiful. Uh, and then there's Lorraine and Sylvia. Okay, very cool. I know Dolly sent me some pictures, actually. Um, she is the yeah. nicest person in the whole world. <laughs> I mean, if you have a chance, read her story in Nona's book, Bamboo Women, because it's heartbreaking, mm -hmm. which, you know, shows you sometimes what our upbringing, some of the, the, the influences of what it's done to us. Mm -hmm. But she is the most giving person in the world. They don't have much, but all her kids have gone to college. Uh, she works on the uh, food line once a week to serve food to the needy. Mm -hmm. She gives to her church. And I mean, I just can't say enough about her. She's mm -hmm. a gentle soul. That's great. And so this was at the Ming Kuang home. Mm -hmm. This is in front of the... The cottage we lived in, and I guess it's one of the few photos. Um, let me just give you some background because some of this breaks your heart. Joanne Wong, Sandy was placed there. Lorraine was put there by, I think, her father. Lorraine and Laverne are sisters. And I didn't meet them again to about 19... 56 because both of them went to San Francisco State. Mm -hmm. Sylvia Liu um, was put in there by her father when the, it was a bit, bitter divorce and she went to UCLA and majored I think in Spanish. Oh wow, very cool. Corinne Liu um, uh, and her sister, older sister were placed at Ming Kuang. Dolly is one of eight or 10 kids. So, I mean, there's a whole story there. And so you can tell by our story, not all of us were orphans or even half orphans. There were divorces, there were, you know, mental issues, things like mm -hmm. that. So, yeah. Okay, this is uh, 1979. This is my. Uh, a doctoral picture that they wow. they put in the state newspaper or whatever they did mm -hmm. that. Okay. Very nice. This is me now. And that's <laughs> that is uh Jefferson. Oh he bites. <laughs> and he's gun shy. If you bring your cell phone near him, he runs and hides under the bed till you leave. Oh it's really cute. Very cute. How old is he? He's four and a half now. Aww. But I got him from a rescue and he was so good 
when I brought him home, I didn't realize that he bit people, but he bit the trainer twice. Oh no. <laughs> at two different lessons. And then he bit my son-in-law because my son-in-law wanted a rough house with him. And so oh. we have to kind of lock him up. Oh, <laughs> very cute. And that's the, the, I can't find the original, it's somewhere, but that's Wilson Riles. And one of the things I did, you see me in my Chinese dress there? Mm -hmm. I learned that if I was going to speak at a very important function, I'm so little, I can't usually reach the podium. Mm -hmm. So I usually bring a, I, at that time, we used to have phone books that were about four inches thick. <laughs> I would carry my phone book in, put it down, and then stand and check the mic and do all those things. But uh, I got, I could get their attention and then I had to worry if I could keep it. But that, that, that wearing that dress with the jacket looked mm -hmm. very professional at that time. Mm -hmm. Wow, very cool. I think that's the last photo there. Yeah, I don't think you, you don't want any of the other ones we have. Um, uh, the other girls have much better photos. Yeah. Um, and besides, you can't stick all those in there. You're supposed to be doing some uh, a project on Ming Kuang, just not on us. And the <laughs> whole thing about Los Gatos. <laughs> well, no, this is all wonderful information. Um, and it's, it's an honor for Daniel and I to be able to get to know all these folks and um, to be able to put these eventually up on the website for people, for the public to um, access. <laughs> How did you guys come upon this project? What, what, what started it? That's a good question. Um, so uh, we're both fairly new librarians. And when I joined Los Gatos Library, I was a first time librarian um, three years ago. And um, I was put in charge of like coordinating the local history section, the programs and the volunteers and, and such. And um, I think over over the years, um, and then Daniel joined uh, maybe about two, one or two years ago. Uh, over the years, we kind of worked together, and we we found that um, there was a lot of history that was missing from the history room and from our collections. Um, we found that most of the focus in our records was on. Um, you know, European settlers um, and the stories of their families. Um, lots of stories about uh, basically uh, people that were not minorities, mm -hmm. um, even though there were um, Japanese American families um, who were farming in this area. There was also, of course, you know, this is a, um, Native American land as well, but we didn't really uh, have a lot of information about that. And so, um, you know, we wanted to sort of put out a call um, to see if anyone would want to talk about their experiences because they're missing from um, our local history section. And, and so Daniel um, sort of headed this project and um, thought it would be really cool to do these interviews. Um, and it's definitely a really great project. So uh, we're very honored to be working on it. Well, it's going to be interesting how you maintain that over time, because mm -hmm. I, when I was doing my research, I went, I called the Oakland Library and then I went down there because they had, I guess in the uh, early 60s, a whole exhibit of Ming Kuang Home. Mm -hmm. And one of the Ming Kong girls put it together and she's got dementia now. And so you can't talk to her. So I went down there and the display is gone. There's mm -hmm. only a few paper clippings, newspaper clippings, like the traditional way of how you find things, you know. And I, I that's when I got the deed of the Ming Kong home and, and established the buying of the land and said, of course it couldn't have happened in 1877 because it wasn't there, mm -hmm. you know? And that's how I started proving things is I had in my own head, 
put down physical locations and then put dates of when they started. Now that doesn't tell you all the intricacies, you know, of the human things that go on or how kids were moved from one flat to another because there's not enough room for them, but there's no record of it. There was, um, there are, and then I went to Stanford Library and there were two books there and one was so old that it was moldy smelling and I kept on sneezing so I couldn't, and the way it was documented, it, it's not the kind of documentation I'm used to where by page or by the end of the chapter, you have footnotes and you can find, you go back and find those. Though the, the first one didn't have it. The second one by uh, Martin Crow, Crowl, C-R-O-W-L was very well documented. And it's not until uh, Judith, Ju, Julia Seiler and her book about Cameron House that we could find some of the things because she's a journalist by trade. Mm -hmm. So I was able to delve some of that. And then I finally wrote her and said, what did you find out about this and that? And she says, she never called us victims of prostitutes or any of that. So mm -hmm. I, I had to tell her the story about it. And so we went to Cameron House, and then I found the actual picker, pictures of took her home. Mm -hmm. And oh, they are darling. These little kids, they had to be two, two and a half, and little boys in coats and hats, and little girls in hats, and they were the first children. And uh, uh, we found that, and then I said, could you go back? And I had the Ming Kwong log, and it was misnamed because if Ming Kwong home didn't start until 1925, it had some entries in there from 1911. And then I looked at the handwriting and Ming Kwong was scribbled on there like it was an afterthought, like they, somebody picked up this, this whole register and didn't know what to do with it. So they just mm -hmm. wrote on there. And so I went back and I went to, I think it was 1911 in 1912 and I found a name and and I said could you at Cameron House look up this name and see if you have any papers on this person and they did she lived it says so and so is living at took her home this is to certify her living uh, address uh, she is learning English and this was to the immigration department who wanted to deport her hmm. So, I mean, it, it's really interesting how all these things are tying in. And um, yesterday, uh, I got a note from uh, a Jerry Wong, who is kind of like the Chinese, uh, she used to be a columnist for Asian Week, but she still has kind of a blog that she sends out every day. And she says, take a look on um, YouTube. There's an a, a interview uh, on Chinatown today and tomorrow, and it's by William Wong. And William was a columnist for the Tribune and the Associated Press, so he's pretty well known. And what I was struck about the whole thing is he showed three pictures of 1906 of three Chinese families that had two generations or more and the background on them. So it shows you that although the Exclusion Act did not have many Chinese women allowed into the country and the men came in, had to be merchants or scholars or diplomats. One of these people, two of them were merchants. One was running a restaurant, another one was running um, a store. And the last one was a, um, what do you call it, the herbalist. And the herbalist was Marge Fong Yu's grandfather. I don't know who that is. <laughs> Marge Fong Yu was a secretary of state for California. She was oh, a okay. ambassador for Guam. She was on oh. the board of education for Oakland Public Schools. Wow, okay. And so, you know, she's kind of, a role model for those of us yeah. that grew up in Oakland that we knew some people had succeeded. But mm -hmm. to, to see that shows you that mm -hmm. it's more than reading some of the uh, census records, or I went back to um, yeah. the, the, the 
textbooks that looked at all the uh, analyzation of the, the census data and showed that women uh, you know, had a tough time, but families emerged and with those families came the same problems that we have today, you know, of, of, of either not getting along or money issues or, you know, ha having to accept children that were from the first marriage. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the log, that's what you'll find some of those reasons for entry, not because they were abandoned or neglected, I mean, I can say I was neglected to a certain extent. I didn't know I was neglected. Right, yeah. It's, it's interesting yeah. because that, obviously you know because you're doing a lot of research, but um, those types of records just don't always exist. And there's yeah. th there are things that are missing, especially when you rely on other people to tell stories that don't relate to their own lives. They, they use whatever is at hand, whatever was actually written down by right. whoever wrote it. Yeah. And so, and it becomes a word. <laughs> exactly. So collecting these types of stories, even, you know, depending on what people want to research in the future or need to know about the history of the town, the history of Ming Kuang, uh, there are some things that you can only learn by hearing people tell their own stories in their own yeah. lives. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, thank you so much for your time. You've been so patient with me, you know, uh, with the, the virus, uh, I do all my meetings on Zoom. And so I had to do a PowerPoint on the female superintendents of California. When I did my dissertation, there were only 11. So I'm thinking, oh, this is gonna be cool. It's gonna be real easy. All I have to do is ask them questions and you do a frequency count. Well, I got a horrible, horrible advisor. She, because I was the first class to get my EDD at at San, uh, University of San Francisco, they had to use us as testing ground. So I learned all about Cronbach coefficient alpha, and I ran 168 questions against 168 questions. Uh, it was a nightmare. And I finally hired somebody who says, just tell me what I need to know. Give me the Reader's <laughs> Digest version, because I don't know how to do all this stuff. <laughs> um. Well, um, I hope that you're able to stay healthy and, and safe thank during you. this time and all that. Uh, thank you so much once again. We're very grateful for your time. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. Great. And call, you know, if you have any questions or need clarifications. Yes, okay? definitely. All right.